Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon. And on this week's edition, we're going to be talking about the embarrassing defeat that Arsenal suffered at the hands of Manchester City. We're going to be talking about the prospect of Mikel Arteta taking over as the new head coach. And we're going to be touching briefly on the UEFA Europa League draw, which sees Arsenal take on the Greek uh, giants, Olympiakos. Joining me on this edition, Mike Stavrou. Welcome back to the show, mate. How are you? Yeah, um, I want to say I'm good, Harry, but you know how, how upsetting it's been as a as an Arsenal fan at the moment. But um, yeah, apart from football, I'm good. Football-wise, not so great. It's been a difficult few weeks, hasn't it? It's been a difficult few months, in fact, being an Arsenal supporter. Now, Mike, most of us expected to get beaten by Manchester City. They're a fantastic side. You know, they're, they're probably out of the title race now, and that's partly down to them maybe not being as good as they were last season, but it's also down to the fact that Liverpool have been absolutely relentless and more consistent than anybody could have ever imagined but they are still in a league above us how did you feel after that game yesterday was it deflation was it something you expected what was sort of your mood after watching Arsenal you know throw the game away very early on no I mean I don't think it came to any of us as a surprise Harry we've been watching Arsenal um, for the last few months especially under Unai Emery uh, even you know, I, I would say probably since since uh, Freddie's come in, even we've probably had about 15 good minutes of play, um, 10 minutes against uh, nine minutes against West Ham, and then and then maybe another five or 10 minutes against Standard Liège, and that's that's it's it's not good enough. So like you know, and West Ham are a poor poor team. Let's not forget. So going up against the champions, who I know have not been in the best form uh, by their standards, but I think we all knew what it was going to be like. The only thing I wanted to see was just a bit more fight, a bit more spirit. And it is it does tell you a lot, Harry, about where the club is at, that um, when a new boss comes in, uh, like Freddie's the interim, but regardless, when Emery went, you'd expect some sort of lift. You'd expect the players to put in, you know, just a, a little bit more than they were because you couldn't excuse it by saying they weren't playing for the manager anymore. The manager's gone. They're, they're there with a club legend. You'd expect more effort. And what I saw yesterday was just the same old rubbish. Um, wasn't helped tactically, but we can go into that in more detail later. But what, what you want to see, number one from a team, is effort and commitment. And to be honest, I, I didn't see that enough yesterday. Absolutely. And I think you, you're absolutely right to say that I guess the problems are a lot more deep-rooted than just Freddie Lundberg or just Unai Emery before him. You know, you can see... There's a a resignation amongst the fans. The fans are not happy. Um, You know, the turnout wasn't great again. And, you know, it it was a game against Manchester City. You know, in my eyes, the the stadium should be packed. And, you know, with all this Mikel Arteta talk, which we'll come on to in a little bit, they were showing clips of of that goal he scored against Manchester City at the Emirates Stadium. And I, I saw, like, I know Arsenal weren't great then either at that particular period in time, but you saw a full Emirates Stadium. You saw a massive cheer when the goal went in. It just feels like all of that is gone at the moment. It feels like people are not enjoying watching Arsenal anymore. People are not as you know interested as they maybe once were. And it feels like our ownership are so disinterested that ultimately as fans, we're eventually going to get to that point as well. And it's really sad because this is our football club. Nobody wants to feel like that. But for me, you know, Freddie Lundberg has been thrown under a bus here and I don't want to say that he's he's been perfect in, in the decisions he's made because there's been a lot that I've disagreed with. But I don't want it for a second ruin my opinion, my personal opinion of Freddie Lundberg by even putting any of the blame onto him because the problems are are far more deep rooted. I mean, he keeps talking about the fact that we don't even have a team of staff. It's not on. This is a multi-billion pound organisation. It's a football club performing at the elite level of our sport and we don't even have enough staff to run on a day-to-day basis. I mean, that stems from the top. I mean... Why has it taken so long? It seems like we're going to get Mikel Arteta now. Um, why, in your opinion, has it taken so long? Do you think that Arteta was always the one? Do you think that Arsenal have spoken to others and maybe been knocked back? What's your take on this whole situation? Well, I think it, it stems from just the the indecision um, even before that. And it, it, it comes from a high level because like, ultimately a lot of people will um, will be reluctant to a, a little bit to pimp blame on the likes of Raul Sanlehi because they don't really know what he does 
um, day in, day out. Same with, with Edu. He, he's, he's come in and no one really knows what he does. But then you have to question who's making these decisions um, in terms of when when Emery was hired and San Leahy was one of them, which is why, Harry, I think that they clung on to Emery for so long. I think he was back in his man because he was the one of the ones that employed him. Yeah. And that indecision to not sack him for a long, long time, it should have been arguably at, at the end of last season. That didn't happen. They gave him a bit more time. But after the Leicester game is, is when they should have done it. Gave him another three games, I think, two games. Should have been done by then. And when you get to that point with the indecision over sacking him, that's when it spills over into knowing who you're going to have next. Because obviously with Emery, they, they didn't know what they wanted. So how do you expect them to know what they want next? Like I'll, I'll use Spurs as, a, as an example, and I hate to do it. I hate to praise them. But they knew, obviously, that Pochettino wasn't working out. So what did they do? They contacted Mourinho, obviously, a few weeks, maybe a month before. They wanted to get rid of Poch. And he slept in the training grounds um, the night before Poch was sacked. And he was literally hired about eight hours after. And that, that is how you do it. Because that's a club that knows what they want. Absolutely. And, and Arsenal are just a club that don't know what they want, quite plainly. I mean, from the top down, they've hired this new team of, of staff. Uh, Hus Femi, you've got Vinay, you've got um, Raul. And now you've got Edu, and it just seems like they have no clue. I mean, I was, I was even seeing stories today that apparently Raul doesn't want Arteta, um, and then apparently um, Edu's not, not even been involved in decision-making. I mean, what what is going on? And no one can really tell us that. So that's why I think what you were talking about earlier, fans are so disconnected because it's all such a mess. The men who are meant to be in the positions to make these decisions are getting it wrong time and time again and that leaves us fans feeling so disconnected from all of it and I'm, I'm just sick of it to be honest I'm sick of it Absolutely I couldn't agree with you, you more and, and we've kind of digressed a little bit onto the managerial um, situation which is my fault because I brought it up obviously um, we'll, we'll go back to the City game for a minute and then we'll, we'll come on to discuss that in a little bit more detail because I think there is a lot to discuss there um, the way it's all happened the way it's all unfolded there's some more reports coming out tonight from David Ornstein at the time of, of us recording this, um, where he says uh, various other bits and pieces, but we'll come on to that in a moment. Let's just focus on that particular game yesterday, which was, of course, bitterly disappointing. There was the first goal um, within two minutes. And, and within two minutes, Arsenal had given themselves an absolute mountain to climb. That's how long we were able to keep City at bay for. And it's, it's not acceptable. Uh, Gabriel Jesus made the move in behind Callum Chambers. He, he gets the cross in. Um, it's a fantastic finish from De Bruyne. It's a very difficult technique. But I mean, Mike, having allowed Jesus to get in behind, surely the likes of Callum Chambers have got to do more to prevent him putting that cross in. It just felt so half-hearted, so lazy. And it felt like, you know, just a, a clear sort of... Uh, identification, if you like, of, of what Arsenal have been in the last few months. Yeah, blocking the cross and also Ser Kolasinac at the far post. Um, just having absolutely just no, no idea. I think that, that was for the second goal, sorry, for, for Sterling. The, the, the first goal, oh, I mean, shambles, lack of responsibility, lack of leadership. I mean, literally, Harry, we, we could record ourselves and play it um, for probably the last three years and just saying the exact same things because it's just not been solved. Um, and yeah, I, what you, the, a point you made earlier is how, how can you blame Freddie really? Um, I guess one slight thing I, I would say is that when things are going really, really bad as they are now, you just have to go back to basics and defend properly. And you're up against Man City, the, the champions, and you're going with two in midfield of Guendouzi and Torreira who well, have, haven't been deployed as sitting midfielders. And it's so obvious that they're, they're going to get cut to shreds. I didn't really think the problem, for at least for the first two goals, was, this, was the defence. I thought it was the two in front of them. There was no protection whatsoever. They were getting pulled apart. And De Bruyne had the freedom of the pitch to do whatever he wanted. And for me, that, that's where the main issue was. Um, if it was me, if I was Freddie, I probably would have put another body in there just to literally shore it up, make us a bit more solid and have some sort of chance um, yeah. to, you know, to, to defend properly. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I think, you know, you, you probably would have been better served. I mean, I know he wanted to get Ozil in the team. He wanted Pepe and Martinelli on the flanks. And I guess 
Freddie's thinking was probably, you know, it doesn't really matter who I select. We can't defend to a high enough standard to contain Manchester City. So we might as well go out there and try and attack them. But that's not what happened because ultimately the game was over after two minutes. And then, of course, you had the second goal. Um, you know, same again, only this time it was Kevin De Bruyne given all the space in a wide area. He had three players around him. And the fact that nobody actually went in to make a challenge was what was the most disappointing thing for me. He was allowed to to take his time. He knew he had players around him, but he never, ever felt under any danger, under any panic. And he put the ball across the box and it did take a slight deflection, I think, which kind of put it into Sterling's path. So I think the Kolasinac blame, you know, he probably should have been tighter to Sterling, but I've got a bit of sympathy for him there because obviously the direction of the ball has slightly changed and, and maybe thrown him off. And then the third one, I mean, again, you're giving Kevin De Bruyne a space. He's already shown you that he's going to punish you once, twice even. How can you allow him to turn the way he did? He's let, literally let the ball run across his body. And I remember at the time thinking, you know what, it's on his left foot. But my God, what a finish it was. And that is why, in my opinion, Kevin De Bruyne is probably the most complete footballer in the Premier League. He can use his left, he can use his right, he can shoot, he can cross, he can pass. He's powerful, he's a dribbler, he's got everything. And we are such a million miles away from a player like that. And I've defended Mesut Ozil for ages, but Kevin De Bruyne is the bar, isn't he? That's what you need to aspire to. And and our version of Kevin De Bruyne is just miles away from that at the minute. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that. I think De Bruyne is probably one of the best players in the world. Not even not even in the Premier League, not even just in his position. I mean, I would, I would put him up with, with, with the likes of... Um, with Messi and Ronaldo, to be honest, because I just think, as you said, he's so complete. Left foot, right foot, range of passing. Um, he even gets stuck in in tackling as well under Pep. He can play as a number six, a number eight, a number ten. I mean, on the wing, it doesn't matter. That's how that's how much quality he has. And I think you're right. He just showed us up yesterday completely. He ran the game. It was the Kevin De Bruyne show, and I think we made that a lot easier for him. I mean, you're right. At no stage did he look un- like he was under any pressure to get closed down. So he just thought forget it and I mean if it wasn't for for Bern Leno yesterday I think the result would have been a lot worse I mean that save um, was out of this world and I think he has spared a lot of our blushes this season Um, no wonder why he looks like such a good keeper because he's facing about 50 shots a game Um, but yeah Harry uh, to be honest I'm I'm, I'm lost for words Um, I think though the the, the most important thing and I'm sure we will get up get um, onto it is the stuff off the pitch and just trying to sort that out because at the end of the day, like, is it going to get to a point where we are, you know, five, six points off the, off the relegations? I'm not saying we're going to get into a relegation battle, but if the form doesn't pick up and we don't sort out the managerial situation this week or next week, I, f- I fear for us, I really do. I mean, I know that's the problem. You, you couldn't really see where a win was going to come from prior to that West Ham game. We managed to, to get a win uh, after a great nine minutes and West Ham have problems of their own. They ultimately capitulated when it mattered and allowed us to, to go on and do what we did. And we thought, you know, maybe this is a turning point. But since then, things still haven't improved. And we mentioned Mesut Ozil. I want to touch on that incident when he was substituted. Now, I was one of the people that defended Granit Xhaka uh, throughout that incident that took place a few weeks ago. I thought he was unfairly treated. I, I don't see why people get so... Uh, I rate about players walking off the pitch a little bit slowly. To me, it's not really that much of a big deal, particularly yesterday when the game was done and dusted and it was as clear as day that that was the case. People getting on Mesut Ozil's back, he got a few boos. Um, He obviously walked off in a bit of a sulk. He kicked his glove up in the air. What did you make of that whole incident? I've heard people saying today he's a disgrace, etc., etc., but these are the same people that criticise him of showing no passion, of showing no fight. And I can tell you, as someone who was in the stadium yesterday, when the second goal went in, when the second goal went in, Mesut Ozil was irate. He was really laying into his back line, really, really animated. That's probably the most animated I've ever seen Mesut Ozil. So those two sort of displays, yes, they're not ideal. Yes, they're not textbook, but people accuse him of not showing any passion. And I thought he did. So where do we sort of stand on this? How do you stand on this? Do we want to see Mesut Ozil showing passion, showing fight? Or do we want to see the reserved Mesut Ozil because that's what stops fans booing? I, I don't know. You, you know what, Harry? I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it out of the, uh, the fan reaction for a second and, and just say, um, I think the way that this club treats our players 
some of our, our players is a disgrace. Firstly, with uh, with with Bozo, as we're talking about it, um, his comments on, on on China, the the club distance them, themselves from from them. Um, Agreed. And let's let's be honest, it's all from from a monetary standpoint. China are one of the biggest investors in in football at the moment. They didn't want to burn bridges there. I sort of get it, but at the same time, they allowed Hector Bellerin to make comments about the UK election. So, you know, they're sending mixed messages here. So I think some of that frustration you showed on the pitch yesterday was boiling over from the club failing to back their own player. I just think Mesut Ozil has been treated terribly by this club. Um, they gave him a, a, a massive contract, which is not his fault. That was that was their decision. Um, and then I think, from from my perspective, Emery was probably told not to play him because they they wanted to get rid of him. They wanted maybe an excuse to, to sell him. Um, and then we go to the to the Jacka thing. How do we treat someone that's been abused by? Um, by fans for months and months and months, and then it ultimately boils over because he, he is a human, which some fans don't understand. We strip him for the captaincy, yeah. and I think I, I think that was the last nail in Unai Emery's coffin, to be honest with you, because the lack of indecision on that um, and coming from above as well. I just think I just think the whole thing's a joke, and I yeah, I, I definitely wasn't one of them people that was berating Mesozo because I try to see them. Um, as, as footballers, but as well as, as humans, as I think you have to, because you know it's such a cauldron, and I think the atmosphere in the Emirates, as you mentioned, is is disgusting at the moment. Agreed. And I, I, I understand fans are upset, but you you have to remember that th- these players, um, as much as we want to uh, stick it to them, we have to support them. We we have to get behind them. Um, no matter what happens, that is literally our job. We're, we're there to support. And I'm, I know it's frustrating. I know it's it's not a very nice time for Arsenal fans, but the number one job, just to get behind the team. And I, I don't feel like fans are doing that at all. I agree. It's almost as though we're kicking them while they're down, which, you know, and you're you're absolutely right to, to bring up the, the whole incident that happened in the week. Mesut Ozil, of course, making some political comments. And, you know, he spoke out about the treatment of, of some Muslim people in in China. And he's absolutely entitled to do that. He is a Muslim, Mesut Ozil. He's a devout Muslim and anyone is entitled to their opinion on anything. So, you know, there's no reason why Mesut Ozil can't have his say. For me, Mesut Ozil never brought the club into the debate, though. He never brought them into the conversation. He spoke out. Mesut Ozil's got a huge social media following. It's even bigger than Arsenal Football Club's following. So Mesut Ozil's gone out there. He said what he said. From my perspective, if I'm the club, maybe I don't really agree with him making a political statement. That's fine. That's one thing. You pull him to the side and you have a word about it. But to come out and clearly sort of distance themselves for it was like you said, it was purely a business decision. And he probably feels a little bit let down by that. Um, Like Granit Xhaka felt down previous, uh, let down, sorry, previously by the club. It seems like the players have almost had enough because they've had enough of some elements of the club as well and how the club is being run. And for me, you know, I just think like it's very easy as fans to be angry during a game and throw abuse at someone. But you've actually got to take a step back. And, and people have been talking in the aftermath of this game about Arsenal players downing tools, not wanting to play for this club. The question you've got to ask yourself is why don't they want to play for this club? This is a huge, historic, fantastic football club that lots of kids growing up would die to play for. But all of a sudden, there's people in that position who don't necessarily want to be there. So you've got to ask yourself those questions as well. Coming back onto the manager talk now, there's been a report this evening uh, coming out of The Athletic where it it describes the fact that Arsenal have had two meetings with Mikel Arteta. We heard earlier in the day um, that he was the front runner. Then we heard that talks had opened with Manchester City. But it's now emerging that the Gunners have held two meetings with Arteta. Um, The club didn't inform Manchester City of these meetings. Mikel Arteta went and done it. And now Manchester City are annoyed with Arsenal for not doing so and are demanding a seven-figure compensation fee for Arteta to be released. Now, that is a report that's emerged literally five minutes before we've gone on to record, so I haven't looked at it in detail, but it feels like there could be a potential bump in the road here, Mike. I mean, it might not be as straightforward as appointment as maybe we'd have hoped. Yeah, I mean, that 
that is a bit bizarre to be honest. You'd think he would um, he would make contact. I think the whole thing is it is a little bit weird because those pictures uh, came out, didn't they, in in the sun of um, uh, apparently V and uh, and Hus leaving his house uh, late last night. But then, how did they get how did they get to Manchester that quickly after playing just yesterday? I don't know. So maybe maybe they're from last week or, or something. But. Um, on the compensation thing, yeah, I think it's a bit bizarre that Arteta's not not let them know. I think, to be honest... It, no, apparently it, Arteta it, has let them know, but oh, Arsenal oh, haven't Sorry. contacted Manchester City right. to okay. say, we are going to start talking with Arteta. Are you okay with that? I think that's where okay. City have got to be in their bonnet. Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, I just think if, if, if that's transpired, I mean, how many opportunities is Arteta going to get? Because... He was he was very close to the job last time when Emery got it, wasn't he? And then it didn't quite go his way. If it doesn't go his way again, um, then then what's going to happen? I, th- I think in that same report, uh, Ornstein said they've spoke they spoke to Arteta and Vieira last week. Yeah. So I think those two are probably the the front runners. But um, I just want to say quickly before we get into the whole Arteta thing and if he is the next manager, what, what he'll be like. I mean, some fans, Harry, and I'm not going to name names, but there's a certain channel. Um, that's that's got a lot of stick recently, and some of it understandable, some not so much. But um, one of the contributors has has already come out and started blasting Mikel Arteta, saying that he hasn't got the experience, um, and essentially it's going to be a failure. The man has not even been appointed yet. We don't even know if he has been offered the job. Like, can you just give it a break for once? I mean, we're talking about bad atmosphere around the Emirates. That is what it's about. That's that's not supporting the team. That's that's prejudging the situation yeah. on an emotional basis. No one knows what he's like as a manager because he's not been a manager. Like this, this stuff just gets to me so much. I, I, I think, just want to get out of it. I think there's a way of of voicing your opinion. There's a way of you know. I've said in the past that I wanted to go down the more experienced route. That I'd have liked to have seen Carlo Ancelotti come in, and we've heard this evening that. He's agreed a deal in principle to take over at Everton. And that frustrates me. It made me almost want to bang my head against the desk that desk out of frustration because it feels like we're missing the boat. We're allowing a top, top manager to go to a club who I believe that if we went up against, he would choose us in that battle. So that makes it really, really frustrating. But I think there's ways of voicing those opinions, ways of, you know, suggesting that maybe something isn't the right decision without it becoming toxic, without giving people... Uh, and, you know, there are idiots out there that latch on to some, certain people's every word. And there is a way of making your point without doing it in such an aggressive way and such a divisive way. And I, I guess that's your point. And that's what, you know, needs to stop. But yeah. we're at this point now where that type of thing has almost been uh, attached to our football club now. It's almost the identity of our fans. And that's what's really frustrating because certain influencers, is that's what they call them nowadays, have ultimately painted this club in a, in a bad light. And it's really, really frustrating. And I don't know how we get away from that now. I mean, I, I really don't see how we divert off that. And when you do start to get it out to sort of non-Arsenal fans that actually we're not all like that, then they see our captain get booed off the pitch. And then they see Mesut Ozil get booed off the pitch. And it's kind of just fueling that narrative over and over again. And it's getting worse and worse. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and look, I don't. I don't agree. Um, Simon Jordan, uh, I think we're we're alluding to, uh, had had a conversation with with Robbie from AFTV, not Austin Fan TV, um, to say that he thinks the fan channel should get shut down. And we can't say that because ultimately, what we're doing now is a fan channel. But I would like to think that we're doing it in a way that is a bit more civilized and a bit more you know, calm, we've, we've collected our thoughts. It's, it's not straight after a game. We're not emotional about it. We're trying as hard as we can to be objective. And I think that's the way that, that you have to do it if you want to have a reasonable debate. And what I think they put, they put across is not a reasonable debate. Um, and it, I think it does. It, it genuinely does give our fan base a bad name. And it probably does contribute to the toxicity in the stadium because it's a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. And I'm, that, that's not to say that I don't feel that too, but I try not to put that across in, in, in yeah. how, how I talk and how I analyze things because then things get muddled and things get, 
hateful and that's not helpful to anything. So I don't understand why you'd be like that. Um, but on the, on the Achilotti thing, I've got to say, I disagree with you. I don't quite think he's the way to go. Um, on, on what basis are you, are you going down the route of, are you one of these fans that wants to see a young progressive coach? Because I get that and I'm okay with that theory, but in my opinion, that's not what Arsenal are doing. That's the cover Arsenal are using for the fact that they won't bring someone in who's going to challenge the status quo, that they won't bring someone in who's going to demand uh, significant transfer funds and that they won't bring in someone who is ultimately going to go in and give everybody a kick up the arse. That's what it feels like to me. If you genuinely feel like we need a young progressive coach, a, a Nagelsmann, someone in that mould, a Ten Hag, whatever, then I, I'm okay with that. I accept that point of view. But all I would say is don't be fooled by Arsenal Football Club. Don't be led into believing that they don't, you, you know, that they believe that's the way to go for footballing reasons. They think that's the way to go because financially it makes more sense and because it doesn't put anyone's yeah. nose out of joint. That's what I think. No, I, I understand what, what you're saying. And my, my thing is, Harry, that you've either got to go two routes. You've got to go with an elite manager, of which I don't think there's many available. I, ju I just don't. I think at this stage in the season, um, there's no elite manager that you're going to attract. Um, the only one I possibly would put in that, ca in that category, and some people would definitely disagree with me, uh, is Mauricio Pochettino. I think he's up there with, with one of the best coaches we could possibly get. And he would be my number one choice. But then if, if you're not going to get someone like that, you have to go for the young progressive because those in the middle, like the, the, the Max Allegri's, the Carlo Ancelotti's, I think they have a ceiling. But like Ancelotti I would, as well. I would I disagree. That of, 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 of what they can achieve. I would and disagree I though that they're in the middle because I would say they're elite coaches. They're top level coaches. Carlo right. Ancelotti's CV speaks for itself. He's won the title in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Italy, in the Premier League. He's won the Champions League on multiple times. He's won a domestic cup everywhere he's been. Carlo Ancelotti has done it all. And my problem right now with Arsenal is, do is it a case of we write off the season and we've got, you know, we're going to finish somewhere between 6th and 10th. It doesn't really matter where in that bracket, but we just accept we're not going to get in Europe. But I, don't, I think it's worse than that at Arsenal at the moment. I think Arsenal are in absolute freefall. And that's why I would put someone like that in. Because I believe that they would have more chance of preventing the fall than somebody who doesn't really have the experience. Than somebody who can't go in and ruffle feathers. Than somebody who is still young and is still learning his trade. And that's my fear about somebody like Mikel Arteta coming in. No, I see what, I see what you're saying. I'm just just on, on Ancelotti... I think he's previously been a very successful coach at very successful clubs, um, of, of which we are not. But you look at his past few jobs, Napoli didn't really work out for, you know, whether it's to do with the board. Bayern Munich, I mean, Bayern Munich, you're not, you're not really judged on the league, you're judged on the, on the Champions League. And then going back to even Real Madrid, I, I don't think he was extremely successful there. So has he necessarily been a successful recently uh, probably not you look, you look at Allegri and he's managed it in Italy he's his English isn't, isn't very well they interviewed him for the for the job initially and apparently they weren't happy um apparently he was he was quite arrogant I've I've heard all this from uh, David Ornstein and he, he said that that's what transpired across in their in, in their interview back then so like who, who you really left with after that and I just think with with, with the likes of them they have a very uh, set set structure um, that they'd have to work in at Arsenal, and I don't necessarily think that they th those type of coaches would thrive there. This look, Arsenal was a massive rebuilding job, right? They, they have, things need to be built up from from the ground up, right? And I don't think like a, an Ancelotti or a Legu type would necessarily mould into that. I just think like basically you need to throw throw a lot of stuff out and completely change it. And I think you do need younger fresher ideas for that i think with, with carlo ancelotti i think he gets a lot of bad press about his last couple of jobs the napoli thing and as you know i cover Serie A quite closely you know the napoli thing was a completely unique situation he's come in 
after uh, Maurizio Sarri, who'd done a fantastic job at Napoli, had them finishing in second place, which is punching well above their weight because they're not even probably in the biggest five clubs in Italy, I would say. So to be in that position w- was incredible. And Ancelotti came in, changed the style, but maintained that in his first season. He managed to finish second again, which is a remarkable achievement. In his second season, this season, a lot of stuff has been going on behind the scenes. There's been this really massive public falling out between uh, De Laurentiis, the Napoli owner, and the players. And Carlo Ancelotti found himself in the middle of that dispute. And in the end, it's cost him his job because he sided with his players. So Carlo Ancelotti has been unfortunate there, in my opinion. And and talking about Bayern Munich, what I would say there is that they are... almost an institution that have to have things done in a certain way there's a lot of interference from the likes of Rummenigge who are sort of sitting in sort of executive positions and they just didn't get on with Carlo Ancelotti they just didn't like his methods it wasn't the buy and way in their eyes and there was a lot of interference there so I think yes you know you're right to say that maybe he hasn't done as well as he could have in his last couple of jobs But I think there was a lot of other influences at work there that made that the case. And I think that, you know, and I'm not saying that this about you, Mike, because I know that you you know your stuff. But there's a lot of people that will look at it on the surface, but won't actually really dive into what actually happened at those places. And that, for me, drives me mad because we're talking about a manager who's done everything in the game. And now, yeah, Yeah, I see your point. You know, he's going to Everton now and you know, probably Arsenal didn't didn't make contact. Arsenal probably didn't, you know, show any interest because I, I genuinely believe if they had, he would have chosen Arsenal over Everton every day of the week. And if Mikel Arteta's appointment doesn't work out, then where do we go from there? I just feel like we needed someone that was going to come in, even if you were offered Ancelotti the remainder of this season and next season. You know, just a short-term deal. Give him whatever money he wants. Put the money on the table. Get him in to stabilise the situation and see where we go from there. I just feel like at a time where we're already in free fall, this is a huge, huge gamble. One that I hope pays off, but I'm worried that it may not. Now, Mike, we're going to just quickly touch on the Europa League draw because that happened today as well. Uh, in all this Arteta talk and management talk, we, we kind of missed this a little bit. But Arsenal will travel to Greece to face uh, Olympiagos, um, the Greek giants, of course, who are notoriously strong at home, but they are poor travellers. It's not the easiest draw we could have got. um, And unless things improve, it's a very dangerous draw, isn't it? Yeah, um, I mean, Harry, I've I've got to ask you, who are you going to be supporting? Oh, Arsenal all day of the week, mate. I don't even support (laughs) Olympiagos in Greece. (laughs) Who's your your Greek team? Uh, AEK Athens. Oh, fair enough. See, Olympiagos is my Greek team. So, um, no, nah, it's not going to be difficult for me. But, yeah, they're a, they're a good team. Do you, do you fancy a, um, a good old jolly up in, in Athens? I do. Um, I'm currently looking into it. That That is a trip I'd yeah, love actually. to do. And it, you know it, what? It, go ahead. It's really annoying because I'm, I'm going to, to Athens in, in May for a stag do. I wish it would. I, I wish it combined because that would be the dream, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And Athens' nightlife is incredible. Oh, it's one of the best yeah. places um, no, for, for nightlife. So, you know, it, look, it, it's, we saw them against Spurs. I thought they gave Spurs a lot of trouble in Greece. They gave Spurs trouble at home as well, didn't they? They were 2-0 up. Yeah. They're a yeah, very dangerous does. side, a few dangerous players. Um, Pedensa in particular, uh, who's looked very, very good. And, and they've got a Portuguese management team in there at the moment who are doing uh, brilliant things. Olympiacos have, have sort of slipped off the, the top of the Greek league in the last couple of seasons, but they seem to be back to their old selves, um, back dominating Greek football. I wouldn't say dominating because it's very close at the top, but they're back as sort of the team to beat in Greece. So I think, you know, having dropped out of the Champions League, this is a potential banana skin for Arsenal. And it's not one I'm necessarily looking forward to. Yeah, I would agree. And I'll just actually quickly before we came on, I had a look at the Greek league and uh, Olympia goes uh, top of the league, unbeaten, conceded five goals in 14 games. So that is going to be a team that are confident. I mean, to, to be fair, even Greek teams, even if they're doing rubbish, they're usually confident when they come up against uh, European teams. That's just that's the way. That's the spirit they have, um, and that's spirit that Arsenal don't have. Um, but of course, you know, we got to see what sort of state we're in when those when those um, games come around. They're a long way away still, aren't could they? Be, could, could be completely different. Um, just quite, I know we've we've chatted the hell out of it. Um, but I did just quickly want to make my case for Arteta. Go ahead. Um, 
because look, I just feel like this, this the state we're in now, you could go with a with a Carlo Ancelotti type, but for, for me, it's not going to make it that much better. I just feel like you've got to roll the dice now because we should have gone for for Arteta initially, but we we chose to go with with uh, Emery, which was obviously the wrong decision. Um, and now you just sort of got to take a risk because like how much worse can it get really? Yeah. Arsenal aren't going to be relegated. I know a lot of people would have been joking about that, or maybe even some haven't. Uh, but then they're, they're not going to get relegated. They're, they're sitting in mid-table. Um, Arteta has been working under arguably one of the best managers of of all time. The, I would say of, of all time of the of the generation at, at very least. And he studied him from what from what we've heard about him. He's a very strong character. He knows exactly how he wants to play. Came through at um, at, at La Masia as well. So he'll play a four three three attacking brand of football. For me, he ticks a lot of boss- boxes. Obviously, the big question mark. He's he, he's never managed. He, he's he's never had to do the um, the he, he's never had to make the big decisions. Yeah. But we know that he's taken a, a lot of training sessions at, at Man City. I think he could he could coach us pretty well. The other side of stuff, how he deals with players, with this, we'll see. But I just feel like for me, you have to take a risk because Arsenal in free fall at the moment, and if you don't take a risk, you could you could slip even worse. And with an with, with an Ancelotti, he could come in. Um, but I think one of the what one of the things he, he has been criticised of, and you can you can correct me if, if if I'm wrong, Harry. But some people say that he's he's nothing more than a than a man manager, and tactically he might not be quite up to scratch. People have questioned these training methods uh, as well. That's one of the things that you know has come out of of the last couple of jobs that he's had. That people don't necessarily agree with these training methods, and we, you know we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, look, I, I mean, you make a great case for Arteta and. You know, more than anybody, I hope that it, you know, it works out if he is, of course, to get the job and we do overcome this new obstacle that we're hearing about this evening, which is, of course, the compensation that Manchester City will be demanding uh, for his release. So, you know, fingers crossed that it, it does work out if that's what's to happen. Um, but I'm just worried at the moment. I am genuinely worried as an Arsenal fan. I don't think I'm I've worried ever, too, man. I, I'm I mean, worried too. I, I don't think I've ever felt this disconnected from my club and this concerned about the direction we are headed. But um, that brings us to the end of the podcast. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining me once again. Do you want to let our listeners know how they can find you on social media? Yeah, so on uh, Twitter, I'm at Mike underscore Stavro, S-T-A-V-R-E. Brilliant stuff. My thanks to every single one of you for tuning in. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe buttons. Um, That really, really helps. And we're closing in on 4,000 subscribers, so please do give us a hand there. If you're listening via the audio, don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform it is that you're tuning in from. And we'll be back very, very soon with some more Arsenal talk uh, coming a little bit later on in the week. Until then, take care.